Welcome to Can You Take It? Today we have for you Anirudh Bhel. Many people have read his name, but very few, except for mainly journalists and his peers, know him. Starting with your career, it, it shows elements constantly of adventurism. Um, are you a serious person? Yes, I am a serious person. But I also have a streak of black humor, you could say, which allows me to survive my seriousness. You said in a, here, this is your quote, it started to get too interesting. It's an intoxicating combination, civic outrage and the thrill of chasing a big story. And that element has carried you through all your jobs, all the work that you've you been see, doing. You see, I became a journalist because there was nothing else that I could do. I just had the skill, perhaps, of communication. So, and journalism a is a job for people who can't do anything else. <laughs> I was primary at heart a novelist. So I wrote oh, yes. my, I wrote I my first say, novel. At the age of 24, crack in the mirror. Yeah. And then I wrote you... my first novel before I became a journalist. Yes. So I took my journalism because that was the closest way I could support my writing. Bunker 13 was your second, second one, one. For which uh, Anirudh got the bad sex prize. And which he was actually delighted yeah, with. Because delighted. there are other authors like Salman Rushdie who refused it. But should we re will you read a bit from your bad sex? Here we are. The passage that... Anirudh Behel really? won the bad sex prize for. <laughs> She's topping up your angel oil for the cross country coming up. Your RPM and, and is hitting a bolo. high high. I'm not too much of a good rider actually. To wait any longer would be to lose prime time. She picks up a Bugatti's momentum. You want her more at a Volkswagen steady trot. Squeezing the maximum mileage out of your gallon of gas. But she's eating up the road with all cylinders blazing. You're insane. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the funny part was that you actually enjoyed getting this prize. You said yeah, you went to London, met all your friends, met Sting who yeah, gave you the I award. Mean, I, I'm not stuck up about, you know, it was a good opportunity to meet Sting and it was a good opportunity to go and connect with everybody. I mean, I, I never, there were a lot of authors who sort of take it as a insult, but I never took it as that. Now, you also said the spy cams were fangs. This is your kind of language, your right kind of written. The spy cams were fangs. We supplied the venom. We showed you could take on systems of governance. Now, as you know, I researched you and the Tehelka Operation West End quite thoroughly when I wrote my book. Wasn't there an element of just plain fun? I mean, I did critique you, criticize you in your book that at one point you became like cowboys. You got carried away with the fun of it, of catching all these people. And you forgot the seriousness of it. No, we didn't actually. For, for the simple reason that no story has survived the kind of, has got the kind of scrutiny as this story has had post-independent India. No journalist in India has been grilled for two months by 60 lawyers on the stand for a particular story. And the story held up. But then uh, the story the held up in all that, its seriousness. But Aniru, the criticism that many people have, and I would have given you the same advice then, was to completely ignore the commission. Completely, that we've done our story, you go figure. Because what they did, they succeeded in turning the attention on into you. Into an inquisition. In, yeah, into, into Tehelka, instead of the people who were and accused. That was, you see, the Commission of Inquiry Act. You fell into a trap. We fell into a trap and also they created such, a, such an atmosphere that if you didn't participate, as if you had something to hide. Mm. So there was an element, so as if there was a transparency, that's right. So it is not that easy a call for us to have taken then to say not to participate in that. It was what was, fault was the clause D of the commission, which was basically turned the focus, not on what the story was telling you, but on the people who had done that the story. That was a very clever clause. That's clause right. That's right. To investigate the sources of... of the media the, platform. Of, yeah. To investigate that and to allow that to happen for the uh, journalistic community to have allowed that clause and many senior lawyers and constitutional experts wrote against it. That's right. I remember Nurani wrote column after column yeah, on that. But it didn't do much which goes to show that you can write whatever you like sometimes and it makes no difference. Tell us about the story when they came to arrest you and you and you went live on Arch Tag. This was at Malviya Nagar and they arrested me and uh, um, I had my mobile phone with me and I immediately called up Uday who was then heading Arch Tag. Uday Shankar. Uday Shankar and Uday immediately uh, put the phone on live in the studio and I started describing my arrest about how they were taking me in the jeep etc and what had happened and I think that was perhaps Remarkable. the first and only case of somebody going live <laughs> while being arrested okay. but to the credit of 
the, um, the Delhi police who came and arrested me, they didn't try to stop my Did they know exactly what Yeah, they happened? were knowing because I was having a conversation in front of them. But they also them. accused you But of perhaps they didn't know it was going live. Mm. They thought that I was just having a conversation. Yeah. I'm sure they didn't know it was going yeah, live. Yeah. Come on. But you were also accused at that time f uh, of um, pushing and beating them up. No, I, that I, was I, a false accusation. Uh, you know, the reputation was that when you used to come into the Telka Commission, everyone used to say, the lawyers used to tell me that Tarun arrives with all these pretty girls and Anirudh arrives with goons. That's not true. You, I mean, you if, the, if, the, if the system in charge, if some reporters, or some others used right. to accompany me. But, so but <laughs> at, at a party, party at Tarun's house on Holi, when you were in the middle of uh, putting together the, the transcripts and the DVDs of, of the Tehelka thing, you went to his house and a Holi party was going on. So and, it was at 5 o'clock in the evening. And you didn't have the keys to the office. And you went there to get the keys because you wanted to get on with your work. And somebody over there, you told them you're not playing because you're going to work and somebody put colour on you and you thrashed him. Something of that nature did happen. <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, I mean, the circumstances perhaps were a little too... Uh, you were tense. Sort of, we were tense and, uh, I mean, you would look back and say that it was an avoidable incident. But then you have to also look at the fact that of people playing holy and throwing colours at you at 5 o'clock in the evening. When the Thelka investigation came out in public, um, Matthew Samuel disappeared. Uh, no, he didn't disappear. He was already in Kerala. He you was sent him to Kerala because he was shooting his mouth off. No, no, I didn't send him to Kerala. He had a health problem. He had gone for some Ayurvedic treatment. Okay. So he was already in Kerala, and and we had to advance our story for a few days because some people had come to know about the Telka office. So we had no option but to go with the story for yeah. our own protection. Yeah. Jen, Jen. Got that's to know. right. That's right. And uh, so the, we advanced. The actually, office. we advanced the story by maybe a week or 10 days or more and Matthew was supposed to come before the story yeah. but he couldn't because we suddenly advanced the but date. But he was talking a lot and you and that he was spoke post to the story. Yeah. That was post And then the you story. told him to shut up. Yeah, he started having a press conference in Trivandrum and then we said that it's avoid, I mean, it's avoided, you, you shouldn't be doing that. There should be one voice on the story. But then that became a problem because the Tarun who did no investigating Credit to him that he created a platform for you to do it, but he did nothing to do with this, this thing in actual operations. But because he's so good at press conferences and becoming the voice of Telka, he took the brand, and, brand of Telka and ran with it. You were pretty much left in the air. Well, you could say that, but then you could also say that I did allow him to do that. Because I generally felt at that time that uh, the CEO of the company has to speak for the company and, and there's a logic in that. And you can't have uh, um, suddenly the company acquired a big public profile and with a big public profile you have to speak in a unified voice. I mean you have to speak in one, you have to speak in one voice. But he became the face of this thing operation, yeah, which, although he didn't do anything at yeah, all. But it, such things happen and... And, uh, and the CBI found an email that you had sent to him complaining about this. Yeah, they did, there was a story like that. And so you did write the email complaining to him that who did the story and you're getting all the credit. It was not so much about credit but about the fact that... Stuff, you're, you're behaving like a politician now. No, I'm not behaving like a yes, politician. Yes, you are. You're <laughs> fluffing it over. You no, did, you, there was a natural resentment that you guys did the story. No, no, I was more complaining about the fact that there should be a V tone in conversation, not an I tone. So, Tarun's conversation subconsciously developed along the like. I. The personal pronoun I, so which is what was the complaint. I said that it should be more we than I. But he really did become the face of this thing when yeah, perhaps. you went into the background. That's right. And, that and in was fact, Matthew Samuel, who did 90% of the tapes, not only went into the background, he just disappeared. Yeah, I guess it's to do with his own sort of nature as well. Would you say that means that in this climate, people who can market themselves are really the successful ones, not the ones with the substance. Well, hasn't that been a fact of life since the beginning? No, not really. Because very often in, say, 30 years ago, you had the substance, you did not need to market yourself, and people uh, respected you and heard you because of your substance. Now, unless you have the combination of marketing yourself, uh, you look at things the, overtake you, which you look, is what happened with you. You look at news television now, and news television right now is gives such a prominence to anchors who have no ABC about journalism. Yeah. And Pretty so it is that same thing. Yeah. So they all come, actually, 
I go to these media institutes sometimes for some lectures and I like to go there and interact with students and I'm absolutely amazed and saddened by the fact that all of them are drawn by the glamour of journalism and they want to be anchors but they don't understand journalism at all. The nitty gritty of it, the, the work, passion that you get in, the, the, hours. the who's and why's and the how's and the when's and the where's and the w's of journalism, they or don't the bother about that, it's just that uh, they, they they want to be famous and, and they believe that riches follow those who are famous. So after you um, <clears throat> moved away from Tehelka, to put it gently, um, you started Cobra for Post, you started doing other sting operations. We started an investigative mm. unit, I think this is a misnomer. I personally prefer the phrase undercover stories Okay. and, and saying undercover stories. So. There are a lot of document-based stories that we do that people don't talk about. So they just confuse us that we're just doing undercover operations. Actually, if you look at a percentage profile, perhaps the undercover story is just a small part of our whole profile. Now, one of the things that you uh, did was the you paid for questions in Parliament. That's right. Which created a big stink. And I think that case has been resolved now. That's you got right. a favorable uh, judgment on that. That's right. In which that the, the judge ruled that it's perfectly reasonable to do this to uncover um, corruption. corruption in parliament and in fact it is your duty to do so. That's right. So those questions that you had prepared, again you went back to your catch-22 obsession. Okay, which is, Tera bachpana nahi jata with your catch-22. That's sort of burned in your brain and heart. Right? We should remember I'm a novelist and my primary impulses are literary. So these are the questions that you wrote. Has the railway ministry placed any order for purchase of Yusarian electro diesel engine from Germany? Is the ministry aware that the Tom Wolf committee report in Germany has halted its induction? Then, has the government given sac sanction for the seed trial of Salinger? Again, another obsession of yours, Cotton of Monsanto. If so, has a report been prepared on Catch 22 so far? And then, the funny one also is. Has the ministry lifted the 1962 ban it imposed on the book For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway and the 1975 ban on Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Hunter's, Hunter Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? If so, when the bans were removed. Now, what if there was some literate person who got it? You were, you well, do you really think there are any? Uh, no, <laughs> no. So you, so you, it's, it's a, it's, you see, just the mere fact, just imagine the mere fact that here are these MPs who are asking, putting in questions in the Indian parliament and nobody's even having a look at those questions or, or even forget, I mean you may not, the MP might not be a literate person he, but he would at least make an attempt to find out who is this? I mean that's a primary, I mean even, I can understand very well and it's perfectly logical that, that an MP from Aurangabad or Gaya or anywhere, I don't expect him to be reading uh, Hunter Thompson or, or Salinger but I at least expect him to be asking people who want those questions done, ki please explain me what it means. And they didn't even do that. They didn't even do that. But so that was the basic failure. And for these questions to land up in the Indian parliament and, and, and sort of float around is itself a big sort of, uh, I mean, uh, absurd scenario. Well, you've done amazing things with doctors, you know, giving fake uh, certificates and operations and all that kind of thing. But do you think it changes? Do you think it has any impact? Do you think today you can say that in parliament people will not take money for questions? Do you think doctors who are doing this kind of malpractice have changed or stopped? Perhaps see, the only thing, the change that I can see is that they're more wary of a sting operation. No, that's not true. That's too cynical an approach. We can't, it's like saying that why should police catch criminals because they'll always be crime. No, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. But do uh, you think that I think in it our has, society it does it have an has impact an impact It or not? does have an impact. Uh, recently, we did an undercover story on Delhi municipal councillors and the uh, whole proceedings are with the Lok Ayukt in Delhi and it does has an impact on civic polity. We, uh, even the uh, Tehelka defence story, it did have an impact in the sense it, it, it led to a revamp of, of procurement methods in the defence ministry which has uh, something to do with the fact that the current uh, MMRCA deal or a file deal, nobody's questioning it because of those procedures put in place at that time. So it, it has impacts where you cannot directly correlate a certain story with an impact but indirectly it does suffuse the system, it does sort of look at the story that we did on in Odisha. I mean every story has an impact whether it is undercover or a normal story. I mean just to give you one small 
act. It's uh, we just story about uh, uh, judges in Odisha being allotted housing hmm. from the discretionary quota of the minister. That discretionary quota has been abolished in Odisha. So it is the little little things. It is these five paisa victories that you have in stories, which 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 is basically the the whole pleasure of being a journalist that you have impacted in some way on a polity. I mean, it, the impact cannot be hundred percent in your stories, but even if it's two paisa, five paisa, six paisa, incrementally it does make an effect. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is that I hear from uh, people who are in the decision making process in the same kind of things that you've exposed. They were also complaining that now nobody takes a decision because they're too scared it'll be questioned. Well, that's their failure. It's a polity's failure. I mean, why can't you take a decision on on logic and and give you logic? Logic can go long. Uh, with, uh, with open uh, tenders, people are okay with the fact that there could be certain wrong decisions because it, it's it's inherent in a decision making process that sometimes you take a right call, sometimes make a wrong call. I mean, I don't think the polity will be disturbed by a wrong call if it's. If it's bona fide wrong call, but the fact that it is not a bona fide what wrong call. What do you think of the paid news sort of racket that's been happening now? I think it's alarming and sad, especially during election times and even otherwise. Do you think that the way the situation is going, that people now, even idealistic people, have no choice but they have to take money from anywhere to survive? I think the problem that has arisen is more from the owner side than the professional journalist side. I mean, journalists are not involved in this, except on occasions where I'm hearing in vernacular media that the journalists are being pushed by the owners to do these deals. And some journalists I know have refused and some journalists have sort of accepted it as a fact of life. If we have a strong journalistic body which opposes it, I think over time it will go away. You have to give them some time and I think it will go away. Now, at some point, about two years ago, was it when you started this Tony B program? This was more, uh, it wasn't really inspired by Borat, it was more kind of impromptu interviews, Ali G kind of genre. Why don't you interview me as Tony B? <laughs> you come to this office, how you come? Walking. You use the horse, I, somebody say you use the horse. Sometimes. The white horse or the black horse? The white horse. Yeah. It is good fun being the news. Your news for the animal or the man? <laughs> for both. <laughs> so it, it went along those lines. But then I said that the whole genre, if you watch it on each, a whole bunch of those things are on but YouTube. But a lot of them didn't catch on. Some of them walked off. They were really furious with you. So a lot of questions that I asked, they pretended that they understood the point. For instance, there would be questions to musicians like... Uh, About the Dalai Lama. Yeah, about global in, warming in and things like that yeah. and that it just came out in a paper and they would all say, yeah, we came out and we read it, even though there had been no news like that. But even in things like where I would go and ask a musician about what they thought about, say, the Basan Rag. It and, and, and it doesn't exist. I mean, it's a, a colloquial UP term and, and they would absolutely pretend that Rag Bhasan and they would absolutely pretend that they knew what it was about but except that they didn't want to talk about it. So in a sense it gave you an insight into the shallow mentality we were developing in, in, in our sort of even our praise three. And the phoniness. And the phoniness and, and this whole compulsion to be in. So you're basically... Uh, Nobody could ever accuse you of that Anirudh. Yeah. Because you're very comfortably being out. Comfortable being out. Yeah, yeah, I'm very comfortable being out. Because I don't want to be in of things at all. Never. I never had that compulsion in me. So what has been your compulsion from the start? I mean, you've, your career has gone in so many different directions. But what was, what is the real compulsion? I can used to say the real compulsion has been, uh, I get bored very easily. And so if I do news for a big stint, I get bored and then I have to go but, back to my books. But you haven't made... And then I have to reinvent something, exactly. keep doing something new. But you haven't made pots of money. You've done adventurous and fun things. But, and you've driven your family, I think, quite crazy with... In times court of, cases. Yeah, court cases. I mean, how many cases do you have against you? You see, over the last 10 years, and it's not a joke, people say that this is the price that you pay for doing stories and, and for the democratic process. Every week for one day I have been in one court or the other. So if you total up the number of days that I have spent in courts over the last 10 years, it would be close to one and a half years around that time. Mm -hmm. And so people have to understand that the mere act of doing a story, investigative story, that's not the end of it, that's the start of a process. Mm -hmm. And especially in India where you don't really 
the state doesn't really have any respect for rule of law. And it's if you annoy the state in some way, they can always use organs of the income no, tax, not, ED. They can, they always do. They always they do. They always do. It's like, you know, when you don't need protection, physical protection. But if you see anyone who has exposed anything that has made any government, whether it's the BJP coalition or the Congress coalition, they, they go about it in the same way. That's right. So there'll be the income tax raid. That's right. There'll be the enforcement directorate. The CBI will be used. CBI, and suddenly you look like a dirty slime ball. That's right. Who's made a lot of money who's, on the side. That's right. And people read that superficially and you're written They will off. also get their own journalists to plant stories with their yeah. particular. So that it's is also when you... Now what happened with Shankar Sharma and Divina Mehra? Very few people actually know how they were systematically, they were actually destroyed. They were destroyed. You guys got away with things because I think journalists, they can harass to a certain level. Um, but then, dharna ho jati hai, press club, everyone gets up in arms. But when a businessman is thrown in jail, nobody cares in India. And the guy went to jail, uh, nobody bothered. His business was destroyed. That was really a sad aspect of Indian polity where you go once removed, I mean, they had nothing to do with the story. But they always go after the owners, they always go after the investor. They don't, because they know nobody will care if something happens to the investor. Nobody will, will raise uh, any noise. That's right, for, for something which in normal case you would get bail on the first day, Shankar was denied bail for like two, three months. Yeah. And that's a very, very sad aspect of Indian polity. I mean, in the sense that uh, that is why I developed this whole need to develop some institutions of civil liberties, whether it's Foundation for Media Professionals and others. And we came together and started that so that there was some, I felt the need that there was no institutional backing for journalists who, who went and did these kind of stories. Maybe there should be an association for the owners who get harassed afterwards. But honestly, the way things happen, all the raids... It happened with the Outlook owners. Outlook. It happened with Telka, obviously. And it keeps happening with uh, other people for limited periods of time until they supposedly strike the a deal. the Commission of Inquiry is the best distraction. And the way it has been put in our constitution is put in a way to create a distraction, not to really get to the bottom of it. So I think one of the stories you should, I would suggest, you start working on is exposing how many commissions of inquiry there have been in every year in every state and the minuscule number that are actually acted on and the number of years that we taxpayers have to pay for these commissions of inquiry. I think it's over time we have degraded our institutions, even those that we had created. And I think we should come out of it and now... And, but I think I'm, I'm optimistic about the future in many ways, even about the media, because I feel that even the Hindi channels and the vernacular channels, which we criticize so much, the good outweighs the sort of bad at the moment and the good is continuously increasing in the sense the kind of accountability they have brought to the system it never existed before i mean they pick up even small things like they would get hold of a video of a daroga beating up a uh, some criminal element to death but what about the accountability of news organizations like the, the cag mentioned ndtv and ibn for uh, the cwg ads which were given without any um, examination or without without spreading it all over the channels. And see, in their audit, they reported that there was wrongdoing over there. So how, why is it that journalists do not report on others? That story, very few people carried. I think uh, that is a culture we have to change. We also have to change this culture of, of not sort of praising media organizations who have done a good story. I mean, uh, Times of India, if, if some website or some small uh, television chimanakula breaks a big story, we have this tendency that other print newspapers will carry the story, but they will but they fail to mention the primary source Times of it. Times of India I think this is not absolute. allowed to mention any other brand unless they pay for it. I mean, this is so absolute. It's not just a problem with Times of India. It's a problem with all one. I mean, Times no. of India may be taking to a certain extreme. No, but other uh, usually other news organizations do mention the source of somebody breaking yeah, a story. But this is they're violating the basic principles of news, and and I think that the editors at some point do need to come together and, and get out of this pettiness. I mean, this pettiness is really sort of harmful. Because you, you, if a small media organization breaks a story, they should get the credit for it and, and you should be large hearted to do that because someday you or yourself will go out and break a story. Yeah, but uh, it's no longer journalism, it's just brand. 
yeah, the selling editorial space uh, in any manner of mean is, is, is a, a dangerous thing because it, it spoils the social contract that we have with our viewers or readers. And we have a social contract that what we give you as news is, is, uh, is sacrosanct, that there's, there is no sort of commercial constraint, there is no extraneous factor coming in between our news and any motive. So if we have violated that, then it's a social contract that we break. And, and a lot of the problems that we're having now with respect to credibility stem from that. And uh, where is Matthew Samuel? I think he's around. He, we keep having court cases and he keeps coming in the Official Secrets Act case that we have against us. Hmm. So I keep seeing him in courts. How many cases do you have against you? Well, at the peak, I had about 15, 20 cases. Right now, there are four or five. Do you see any way to, that journalists can protect themselves against this? I think we have to do something about criminal, criminal defamation in this country. It's outrageous that you have criminal defamation against media. Uh, secondly, the state comes up every now and then with their version of the broadcast bill which they try to run as a mouse in order to control the media indirectly. And I think they never talk about improving the, or putting any clauses for the protection of the working journalist in terms of source protection, that the courts or anybody else can't compel you to uh, talk about your sources, like we talked about a little earlier, in terms of uh, uh, protections from uh, your uh, harassment from state organs, you know, uh, in, in terms of Whistleblower Protection Act, so which is, which is a big lacuna in our system. And I what think do you we think should, of Kaju? I think that uh, it's a... Uh, uh, he, he has uh, a certain uh, uh, views which uh, don't sort of go well with being the press council chairman because fundamentally you have to uh, talk about freedom of expression and, and his views on most occasions are sort of uh, degrading or degrading the freedom of expression as aspect of it in many ways. And uh, I think you have to do it with a lot of consensus building. We know there's a lot of problem with, particularly with uh, uh, some vernacular media and even with national uh, sort of... The, uh, what they don't realize is that print keeps harping about television, but print also has... And then now they're coming up with these internet laws. So it will affect every mainstream media because they all have web sort yeah. of presence. And so it affects them equally uh, it affects the television, it affects print, so it's all converging onto one platform. So I don't think there's going to be any, any print or television, you can't distinguish them anymore. Mm -hmm. Because everybody would have all presences in some form yeah. or the other. A print journalist would have certain videos on their sites, they would all have websites, they all have internet presences. So it's, it's all converging on a peculiar platform. So uh, as I said, you won't be able to distinguish between them very soon. What are the mistakes in Telka if you look back? In, 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 this, in the Operation West End? We definitely could have edited it to a much shorter version than we finally did. Four and a half hours is long. I mean, we were thinking print even in television. I don't think it was the length. <clears throat> I think length doesn't matter in this. When you're doing something no, as a, a big story product, like this. A television product, it does matter. Ultimately, a television product is there by default. Because uh, in these situations, the only reason you're using hidden cameras is that the burden of evidence is, that is required is much more than other stories. And because the burden of evidence is so high, so video comes by default. So it's basically your, you need to have that burden of evidence. That's why you go video. When, when Arun, and when you create video, you, you have a product. When I interviewed Arun Shuri at that time about this, and he had done, I would say, the first sting without a camera. Kamla, yeah, that's yeah, right. Kamla, when he, that's saw, right. So when he was editor of Indian Express. And he had, at that time, informed a Chief Justice. That, that's so much so bogus that you can't really, in today's context, go about informing authority of what you're doing, seeing the degradation of various institutions. You, you would never uh, trust anybody with, with those kind of information, by the, by the lives person, of your reporter. One person you could trust. Say Justice Varma or something. No way. At least I wouldn't do that. I mean, so this is all about it, it. You just have to go by normal common sense and the way this law has developed in the UK and the US, which is very good that you have to have prior information about certain illegalities being happening. So it is not uh, a 
so that it doesn't go into a fishing expedition largely. And uh, in case uh, those people are demanding some things, the, it, it has to be, in a sense, uh, um, as I said, commensurate with the situation. So, in, in, in that sense, I think if you follow that, and public interest obviously is the overall defining factor, I think you'll be right. I think, by and large, with journalists, I've seen that if you still believe that breaking the story is the biggest virtue around, and you get a thrill doing it, a journalist will always be okay. But if you find that you, do, you know the thrill no longer matters to you, then it's time to leave journalism. I can't imagine it not mattering to anyone. I think I mean, there are journalists today who it doesn't matter at all. That's, what I, that's the point I'm trying to make. There are a whole load of journalists that I see who see it as a product and to them breaking a story is no virtue at all. Honestly, they don't, they don't even think of it as a virtue. Which is where I come, I'm coming back, you see, because that, 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 that has failed to become uh, one of their, sort of their content, being a face on Taking television. Taking handouts. Taking handouts, etc, etc. So, as I said, that w there is no longer a virtue right now. It's, it's, it's a virtue with just a few. Thank you, Anirudh. I Thanks thought this mother. would be a really funny interview because Anirudh, in real life, off camera, is quite funny. And in this interview, he's been all serious. So I apologize for him. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>